Hello there and welcome back to Matt and Miner in the morning. I'm channel technical agronomist Matt Nelson. Today we're going to do part three of our Matt and Miner in the morning uh, year in review. I'm going to take us through the latter parts of grain fill and, and into harvest and Jeremy is going to put a bow on this year as well as preview uh, what we can expect in 2022 which is which is upon us. Planting is only uh, a few months uh, ahead of us which uh, seems hard to believe. Getting right back into the grain fill period, uh, again, in our first video, I carried uh, the conversation from planting through the, the earlier vegetative stages, and Jeremy took it from there uh, through the reproductive stage. And I'm going to cover uh, this ending part of grain fill really starting in August. Um, August was, was warm. Uh, however, most regions got some much needed rainfall, as you can see uh, from some of these departure from normal precip maps. Uh, the southern part of the state saw more rain in, in July, but the rest of the state uh, saw more rain in August, which was really needed. Uh, some soybeans uh, really started to put on vertical growth and uh, it really improved the crop condition pretty dramatically. Still really warm, right, in August, as you can see from this temperature graph. But uh, th that really carries me into what I want to talk about in terms of stress at this time of the year. And it, it's kind of two basic concepts about what stress does to corn um, and maturity. So if we're stressed before pollination, uh, corn's maturity is actually slowed, and that can be a good thing. When we're stressed after pollination, it speeds up how fast the, those those corn hybrids mature, and, and that's a bad thing. We're going to get into that now. As we, again, the summary for August was high daytime and nighttime temperatures, and that leads to uh, rapid GDU accumulation and, and early maturation. And, and you can see that in this picture up here uh, on the right, which Jeremy Miner took. Uh, this was of, of 2906, 109-day hybrid, and 214.45, a product that's maybe more like 115-day hybrid, planted a little bit later. And you can see this was in, in, in early September. Uh, that 109-day uh, was able to mature a lot more normally, but that really full-season product with that shortening of, of the grain fill period due to high temperatures and stress was not able to put nearly as much moisture into, into those kernels uh, and as much weight into those kernels, which is why that ear size is so small. Uh, when you compare the two. If you think about, you know, obviously we know high daytime temperatures can cause issues with making photosynthesis if we have leaf rolling, but the nighttime temperatures are something that we heard brought up a lot and I thought was was worth diving into a little bit. Normally we think about warm nights as, as not giving the plant a break from respiration. Uh, you know, during the day, the plant's making energy through photosynthesis and rapid respiration at night can burn through those sugars a lot quicker. Over time, research hasn't really connected the yield impact with with purely increased respiration. We know we know that plants respire respire more when the nighttime temps are high, but uh, I actually think uh, the data shows that most of the yield impact comes from just the shortening of the the amount of time that we have for grain fill. Right. So uh, if we reduce, for, if we think about between silk and maturity, if we shorten the number of days that that plant can make photosynthesis, all we're doing is is pulling energy out of those kernels. Uh, and taking away from yield as we don't have as many days to make energy. Uh, and at uh, this time, we really saw plants, if, if they couldn't get the energy they needed, start to either cannibalize the stock or in soybeans, as you can see here in August, uh, some pods starting to abort and drop to the bottom of the, uh, you know, of the canopy. As we move into September, again, we saw kind of unseasonably warm temperatures, uh, a very, very nice, pleasant month of September, uh, still fairly dry, not, not a lot of moisture received. Uh, but those warm temperatures were actually a good thing for grain fill if your plants were alive to take advantage of the good weather. Uh, full of season soybeans uh, around now really started to separate when we looked at harvest data. For me, I think if it was anywhere between Highway 20 and Highway 30 South, uh, those fuller season soybean varieties really added a lot more yield than their earlier counterparts, especially if you went from like a 2.1 to a 3.0, um, you know, almost a full a full stage jump in maturity. And then uh, again, we had some some plants, some cannibalization occurring in corn. Uh, we also had uh, following that cannibalization, uh, some stock rots and some root rots start to, to set in despite having dry conditions, conditions that maybe aren't always conducive for most stocks or, or crown rots. That carried us into October, which was a completely different month uh, than, the, than the two prior. A lot of rain and a lot of wind. So the rain was obviously good for recharge, but but not a good thing for stock quality when you pair it with the wind. It was actually our, our wettest stretch in October in, in nearly 30 years. And uh, a lot of consecutive days with long periods of slow, steady rain. 
And in some some areas got more rain in October than they received the entire growing season. So almost eight or nine inches in places in eastern Iowa. So uh, this is actually a, a trend that we'll talk about a little bit later. But this seems to be the norm as we think about our last few harvest periods going back a couple of years. Uh, those winds caused a, a lot of the stock breakage like you see in this picture here. This is a picture that I took in north central Iowa. Um, and another thing we noticed as well was uh, if we if we planted earlier season hybrids, with the idea of having them picked early as our drier corn, uh, that kind of got disrupted this year. That plan got disrupted. If you think about, you know, getting into soybeans for maybe a, a little bit longer uh, than maybe farmers expected they would, by the time they got to corn, we started to have some wet weather. Uh, and all of a sudden, those 103, four or five day hybrids that you wanted to be dry are now really dry by the time they were harvested. They were down, in some cases I saw, uh, reports come in of them being at 13% moisture uh, when they took them to town. So that's that's usually a really bad day for those early hybrids to leave them out that long. Wanted to cover a few basics on corn biology as well. These are just really some simple concepts that I think we lose sight of. First is that corn is was bred to stay intact until about 20% moisture. If you think about when we've harvested corn over time traditionally, a lot of times that harvest started well above 20% moisture, whether that grain was being used as high moisture corn feed um, or being dried. Now, as we think about our, our current environment, we've got a lot of operations that uh, that don't start picking corn until it's at 18% moisture or below, when in reality in the past, that's when we used to finish uh, harvesting corn was when it got to that point. So uh, again, as you think about wet October months, plus waiting till that corn is, is a lot drier naturally, now we're starting to complicate the harvest picture and, and induce introduce more chances for error and, and for standability issues at harvest. Especially when you think about this spring and in, in the first video, we talked a lot about how quickly we planted corn in the last part of April. If we slam everything in four days, we've, we've now left ourselves little room to spread risk out, whether that's from insect pressure or in my opinion, the big one is weather. If you plant all of your hybrids and, and they're around the same maturity in, in three days, those products are now going to all hit the same stress as we go through the growing season. Second one I wanted to talk about, we already mentioned, that's Mother Nature dictating the speed of relative maturity. Uh, again, stress before pollination equals slower maturity, stress after pollination equals more rapid maturity. And the last one is uh, just to remind us all of the plant's overall goal, which is to produce viable seed at all costs. Uh, as I have here, if you pardon the phrase, the, the stock will fall on the grenade for the ear if it needs to. Uh, again, that corn plant is, is bred to make that seed as viable and, and robust as possible. And it's going to do that uh, come hell or high water. And, and that's something that we really see in, in stressed years like we had in 2021. I also wanted to cover some of the lodged corn late in some areas, particularly in, in the eastern part of the state where we had uh, more unpredictable weather and a lot more moisture stress. And as you can see here, this is uh, certainly not an inclusive list, but this is a, a, a large list of, of things that uh, I, myself as an agronomist think can impact stock integrity late in the year. And it goes all the way back to, to fall tillage. It includes, you know, planting and, and, and our depth of planting, our, our seed trench, emergence, things like that. Um, warm nighttime temperatures, we already talked about that. Diseases, uh, insect feeding. Uh, there's a lot of complicated issues that all play into whether or not a, a plant has stock integrity uh, at the end of the year. And, and I wanted to kind of highlight those here and then also dive into them a little bit more here. As we, this is a, a list that I pulled from Iowa State that I think also matches the list that I, that I pulled uh, pretty well. Again, a lot of, lot of reasons and risk factors for why we might see, in this case, stock rots. And as we think about the actual standability, this is a, a little flow chart that I found that I think is really helpful. So as we think about, you know, a late season stock issue is what we would call stock lodging. And that there's really two components that play into that. The first is the physical strength of that stock. So we're talking about both the morph the overall morphology of that corn stock and then also the rind thickness. So the rind is that that hard outer coating. It's made of pr uh, primarily lignin uh, that's very rigid and sturdy. It gives the the plant a lot of its uh, its its stability. But then we've got the intactness of the pith on the inside of the stock that fills out. Uh, the inner cavity and, and kind of helps keep that stock intact. There's a lot of things that contribute to that. Uh, the primarily one that can uh, factor that can you know impact stock intactness is sugar loss uh, or cannibalization. And and you can see here, right? There's a lot of factors that play into that: nutrient imbalance, cloudy days, high planting populations, foliar disease, physical leaf damage, insect damage. 
and and th those don't even you know include the, the stock and the crown rots like anthracnose or fusarium. So uh, again, it's a very complicated picture. There's a lot of things that determine uh, whether or not that stock is going to stay upright and intact, uh, especially as we get later into the harvest period. So. Where did the yield come from, Matt? This is a question I've heard over and over again. I'm still getting asked this question here as we sit in, in early February. This is the best summary that I can come up with. The first is that uh, timely rain gets a lot of credit along with improved genetics. Uh, our corn hybrids and soybean varieties uh, today are, are, are so much more uh, drought tolerant than I think we've been in the past. If you, if you take this year we had weather-wise and, and move back 20 years with the, with the, the hybrids and varieties we're planting at the time, I, I think the outcome is probably a lot different. Uh, I, I also think the drought conditions early on really did help. Uh, we learned corn and soybean do not like early wetness. And if this is one thing that you take home uh, for future years, I think it's a really important one. States, states like Illinois really struggle more from lack of moisture. Iowa really struggles from too much moisture. If you think about the amount of clay and silt in our soils, especially as you get into the north and north central part of the state, Wetness really hampers our development. I've actually seen some fields where even in a dry year from the eastern part of the state where they were in D2 drought almost all summer, the fields with the narrowest tile centers still did the best, even though there could not have been much water for those tiles to drain. It all has to do with uh, how deep those roots can uh, if they've got access to oxygen. So uh, again, moisture. I think moisture can sometimes be the enemy in the state of Iowa. Also, correct placement and management decisions made a really large impact. Having adequate fertility, uh, a balanced pH, uh, the right population for your hybrid, uh, fungicide use, all of those things definitely played a role. And then lastly, I think when you couple early planting with good grain fill conditions, that is probably the recipe for maximum yield potential across the state of Iowa, um, coupled with that those you know dry early conditions. These are a few you know, tweets that I pulled from people in, in the agronomy world that I, I think kind of showcase that. The first comes from Sean Conley, who is a soybean professor at the University of Wisconsin. He tweeted this back during the summer that while everyone is concerned about the drought, now is probably the best one to have one for soybean. Again, talking here about that June, July timeframe. Uh, and he points out that even though um, we're, we're dry, less than 15% of the total soybean dry matter is achieved by the time we get to the beginning of flowering. So as long as we pick up that later rainfall, uh, we'll be just fine. And, and I think that's the case that played out in Iowa this year. And then Nicole is a, is a, is a Bayer agronomist, a, a colleague of mine over in East Central Iowa with, with Asgard to Calvin. She pointed out something I thought that was really interesting. So you've got two corn hybrids. Uh, hybrid one here in, in, is in the top in both pictures and hybrid two is in the bottom planted at a couple different populations. And in that photo on the left, you can see uh, both pictures handled that population well. And as we move to the right, one of those hybrids uh, has the same root mass at both 28,000 and 39,000. And the other one has a much, much, much inferior root mass, almost half the size. And that goes back to uh, the way that we place products and understanding what, you know, how our management impacts uh, our hybrids uh, and vice versa. Here's my summary for grain fill before I kick it over to Jeremy, who is going to kind of put a bow on the year and then preview what we can look forward to in 2022. Our summers are a lot drier and warmer than they have been previously with a much longer grain fill period in September, followed by a very wet harvest period. I, I This is maybe take home number two for me as an agronomist. I've seen this weather pattern emerge the last three or four years, and it seems to be the trend that we'll be in for the future. Um, with that, it's a question you need to ask yourself, are your crops still alive to take advantage of that good late grain fill? Uh, if we're planting uh, a 2.0 maturity soybean instead of a 3.0 maturity soybean, we're going to be maturing long before we get to maybe that late rainfall and some of those good conditions for grain fill. So I think it's ser seriously worth considering spreading some of that relative maturity out across an operation to take advantage of this better late weather and also to make harvest a little bit more manageable. Again, as we talked about, little things made a big difference in 2021, whether it was fertility or management practices in the field. This is something uh, I also am, am pretty adamant about as an agronomist. If we're looking to plant a 100 to 105 day corn hybrid uh, in central Iowa, looking to, to take it out early and, and, and get some early dry corn, uh, whatever you want to plant in that range, consider bumping it up a few days fuller season or more. And the reason for that is, again, if we, if we think about planting beans first and, and having a lot of soybeans that are ready, 
before we even start on corn. And then all of a sudden, if we have a wet month of October, now we've got those really early products that are not getting harvested at the time that they should. And, and I have this kind of tongue in cheek there that, uh, you know, 104 day hybrid planting on April 25th will not stand like a redwood until Thanksgiving. It's just not going to. And I think we need to be cognizant of that, especially with how wet the last few falls have been. Uh, we already talked about genetic diversity um, and also diversity in planting date and how that can help spread out risk on your operation. Um, another one I, I always like to point out is, you know, if we, fer if we fertilize for a certain yield level, whether it's 200 bushel corn, whatever it might be, and we get 50, 60 bushels over that, that fertility still came from somewhere. There's a budget that has to be balanced. It, it could be contributions from organic matter or from, from better, uh, you know, early, min er early access to nitrogen. Uh, to whether that some of that could have been, you know, also stock cannibalization, which we saw a lot of this year. Um, just making sure we understand that if if we plan for X and, and we what we got much, much exceeded that, that fertility is still coming from somewhere. And the last one is that this is just kind of a hunch of mine. Uh, soybeans like fertility. Again, we don't do a lot of fertilizing of soybeans, especially following corn, um, you know, from a, a fall or spring perspective. But I, I wonder if the derecho didn't contribute to some of the soybean yields we saw here in central Iowa. If you go back to 2020 and think about how much of that grain and, and, and residue uh, was tilled up in, in late August, early September, uh, and left in the soil. Uh, part of me does wonder if that added for uh, that added, uh, you know, nutrient boost provided some enhanced yields in our soybean crops this year. So just just something I'm curious to see if if we get any research confirming in the coming years. With that, I'm going to hand it off to Jeremy, who is going to take you the rest of the way. Hey, Matt, thanks a lot for that. We appreciate that wrap up on the uh, harvest side of 2021. I think in order to really put a bow on this, we need to go back and take a look one last time, find out if there's anything that we learned specifically in 2021, and if there's anything we can use uh, in order to help us be more successful in 2022. So once we do this, we will actually close the book on 2021 and get us ready for the 2022 crop season. So to start off, what did we learn from 2021? Channel genetics can take a licking and keep on ticking. I think if you've planted channel genetics before, you know that there are products that uh, really have a broad acre fit. There's a lot of products with natural stress tolerance that really prove themselves in 2021, uh, whether they have the drought guard gene or just natural tolerance. Uh, there's a lot of products out there that can cover just about any acre. So um, we learned that they can really take a beating and, and really pull through for the year that was thrown at them. A little rain can go a long way. In some cases, we were five to maybe 12 inches below normal for the growing season of 2021. And all it takes is a couple of, I say all it takes, it takes a couple of key rainfall events and we can really put ourselves in position to have a decent crop out there. So I think we learned that, you know, even though we can go two and three weeks in between rainfalls, if we get the, the rain that comes at a key time, we can still have a, a pretty successful growing season. It may not be ideal, uh, but it, we can still be pretty successful. Planning and harvesting early and late can really become a risk, uh, a game of risk versus reward. Planning early is great. Um, we just have to kind of set our expectations of what's going on during that time. If we have cold soils, um, you know, that seed might sit there for two to three weeks, which a lot of it did this year. Um, so that's something that can set us up for, um, you know, early disease infections, seedling blights, those types of things, which may limit stand. Harvesting, uh, harvesting late certainly became a game of risk versus reward. Uh, a lot of guys like to let um, corn especially dry down, you know, um, get sub 20 before we start harvesting. I and mean, I think we learned this year that um, in a stressful year or a drought situation like where we were at, we pushed maturity on a lot of products and a lot of early things finished even earlier than we thought. So um, it's always good to be out there paying attention to what's going on and making sure that uh, that we're out there in a timely fashion. Balance fertility, very critical, especially in drought years. If you guys are soil testing, hopefully you've uh, reviewed your soil test results and uh, you know what you're going to do for fertilizer this upcoming season. Um, 2021 was just crazy and you know a lot of fertility was out there 
but a lot of it wasn't available to plants. So hopefully you guys, if you haven't soil tested before, hopefully you're doing that because with fertility and fertilizer prices the way they are, we really need to understand what is going on out in the field in order to put the right products out on those fields and make them productive. So again, balanced fertility, very critical to keep plants healthy, uh, especially in drought stress situations. Insects and diseases, still going to be a problem, still going to keep us on our toes. Uh, and we had just different kinds of problems than maybe what we're used to seeing. Uh, and in 2021, you know, I talked about wireworms and white grubs early on in the season. Boy, that they were a problem. Beanleaf beetles came out uh, much earlier than, than what I'd seen them in the past. And, um, you know, things like tar spot. All of a sudden, we had a huge flare up of tar spot, but we really didn't see a lot of gray leaf spot or northern corn leaf blight. So, uh, again, it just depends on the year, but we're learning that uh, different things flare up at different times, and we just have to be on our toes for that. Having multiple weed management plans and timely applications, they are a good thing. Um, kind of like the same as the uh, the fertilizer situation. We're in a supply shortage on some products uh, related to herbicides. So it's good to have multiple plans ready to go. We want to make sure that uh, if our favorite uh, herbicide isn't available, we have a plan B and maybe even a plan C just to make sure that we're able to when we need to and, and you know when we are supposed to be out there, we are out there uh, making timely applications to take care of those weeds. Multiple modes of action, uh, residual activity, that's what we want in order to keep those weeds at bay. Uh, and then drought and heat. Um, they force us to be more agile in all of our field activities. So whether it's a fungicide application, herbicide application for weed control, fertilizers, any of that type of stuff, um, when we are under drought stress, boy, that just, it forces plants, um, crops and weeds both to just do things differently. And we really need to uh, be focused on what's going on out in the fields and making sure that uh, we're ready to go and ready to be proactive when we need to be. So what are some of the keys that we can focus on to help us succeed in 2022? It all starts with solid genetics and making sure that uh, we place those products in order to maximize that performance potential. So there's three keys right there. We need to review agronomics of our products. Yield is always going to be there, but we want to review agronomics to make sure that we place to perform. We want to put those products where they need to be in order to maximize that performance potential. And then once we've made a selection for a product to a field, we want to make sure that we stick to that plan. I know that can be hard. And when you look back like uh, after a harvest in 2021, probably thinking, oh man, I should have planted, you know, 208.38 over here and I should have planted 210.79 uh, over here. Well, you know, we can kick ourselves all day long doing those things, but, you know, when it comes down to it, hopefully you've sit, you've sat down with your seedsmen uh, and, and, and reviewed the agronomics and hopefully you guys have developed a plan uh, to place specific products in specific fields. It's just better off to stick to that plan. We don't know what Mother Nature is going to deal with us, but the best thing we can do is just those first two things. Review the agronomics, place the products where they need to be, and just stick to that plan. That way we give our products uh, the best potential to, uh, to do their thing out in the field and provide good yields. So I think that's something that we learned in 2021. Check equipment settings early and often. It pays to get off of the tractor and do some digging around or just some checking on, on our equipment that's out there. Um, that picture on the left there, um, that is a problem. Uneven emergence costs us bushels. And I saw quite a few fields this year where plants uh, that emerged late were just not the plants that actually did anything. And in fact, Precision Planning did a study and they suggest that a plant that emerges one day later uh, in emergence, it can lose 15% of its yield. If that plant or a plant emerges two days later, we're over 50% um, yield loss for that particular plant that's late. So it pays to get out there and understand um, what's going on in the field, but it starts with how our equipment is set up. So checking things like planter speed, making sure we're doing that right, making sure we're planting the right population for the right hybrid. We have a couple of products that are more flex hybrids and they don't need a lot of population. Uh, those are good things to just pay attention to. Seeding depth, getting that seed to moisture, but getting it down there evenly. 
Um, downforce, that was a huge one this year. I've seen a couple of instances where the planters were actually lifted up out of the ground because there was so much downforce. And once they hit the hard pan, we had some lift um, causing uneven emergence. Row cleaners, disc openers, seed firmers, closing wheels, all of those pieces of equipment on the planter can affect uh, emergence. And again, a major problem in that that's something that can cost us bushels. And in fact, here's a situation that I saw where it did cost bushels. Um, this is a, a particular channel hybrid that, you know, it's everybody's favorite. Went to a field where a customer was wondering why he was having some down corn and the yields were off. And you can see just by looking at those particular plants, they're skinny. They were shorter. They were falling over. Well, they actually ended up about an inch uh, inch and a half below the ground. So again, they were behind, they started late, they got shaded out. They tried to develop an ear and they did. And for what they went through, I'm surprised that the ears look like that. Um, but uh, boy, I mean, they, they tried to do everything they can to produce seed. And then when you go back and you look at the plants that actually emerged evenly and emerged early and on time, uh, again, a big difference there. So uneven emergence cost a lot of bushels last year and it comes down to checking those planter settings early and often. Scouting early and often and in the field. That is another thing that we can apply towards that 2022 season that's coming up. If we can scout early and often and find something in the field, usually, typically, we can be um, proactive in managing those types of situations. So, um, you know, if we have a shovel, it's always good to dig up some plants and check things below ground to make sure that, uh, you know, we understand what's going on. I was in a lodged field where I was able to dig up some roots here and find out that it wasn't a corn rootworm issue. It was sidewall compaction. You can see all those roots growing out of that one side of that plant there. Um, getting out and, you know, in the field and down the rows. Inside the gate is great. Drive-bys are great, but man, it really pays to get out there and look uh, in those low spots up on the hillsides. Um, get a good look at that field, but especially get down the rows and uh, see if you can see any problems from there. Because, you know, like I said, we can be a little bit more proactive in a situation like that if we know something's going on. Uh, and definitely before harvest, especially in a stressful year like 2021, it, it pays to get out there early doing that pinch and push test and adjusting your harvest order if you need to. But again, scouting early, scouting often, and scouting in the field, a key to being successful in 2021. We talked a little bit earlier about multiple modes of action and having overlapping residuals and timely applications of herbicides. That is definitely a key to success for 2022. My iPad is nine and a half inches tall, so you can guess that that mare's tail right there is twice that. Uh, again, very tall and the likelihood of that that weed actually dying, <laughs> um, not very uh, not very likely. So again, it pays to be timely. Get out there as soon as we can. 14 to 21 days after emergence, uh, just mark it on the calendar. I think that's the time that we need to be really out there and thinking about getting those uh, those post applications on there. Um, an example of water hemp, an emerged water hemp will double its growing points every two inches in height. So um, the more growing points you have, again, the harder it is to kill a weed like, like water hemp. So, um, Pays to get out there early, get them when they're small, and uh, you know that's going to give our crops a better chance at uh, battling through some of those stressful situations. Uh, along with the timely application is is reading the label. Um, with the use of multiple products that we may have to do this year, you know, having a plan A, a plan B, and a plan C, maybe um, checking the label so we can avoid any sort of crop injury. Um, these plants here are the same, almost the same vegetative stage at the, that V5, V6 timeframe. And some product labels, um, you know, restrict spray by vegetative stage, but some also um, give a height restriction as well. And as you can see here, even though these are the same or relatively the same vegetative stage, the plant height is totally different. One is almost twice as tall. That, that uh, plant on the left is almost twice as tall as that plant on the right, even though they are roughly the same vegetative stage. So it, it does pay um, to get out there in time, but then also to be timely as far as checking the, the height of your crop and making sure that we're on label so we don't cause any crop injury. Fungicides. Uh, fungicides were um, very helpful, I think, in 2021. Um, it's something we need to pay attention to in 2022. Yes, they do cost some money, but 
they can also protect us, uh, protect our yields and and provide us uh, with some plant health benefits too to help make us some money. So some things to target, high yield response fields and acres, usually the high yielding acres are the ones that you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of when it comes to applying a fungicide. Um, products known to respond to fungicides. So we have a list of which products do uh, respond well and products that maybe don't respond as well to fungicides. So make sure you're talking again to your channel seedsman or your sales rep uh, or your technical agronomist to understand that. And uh, we'll help get that information to you if you don't have it. Known uh, high disease risk environments like continuous corn. Those are obvious ones where we should just plan on a fungicide because the chances are good with a lot of the diseases that live in and overwinter and residue, chances are they will be back in some way, shape, or form, or, or some disease will in those areas. Again, target those areas for disease, uh, for fungicide application due to diseases. So I have this map here, and if you guessed it already, great, um, but that is an actual disease map related to tar spots. So again, you can see the entire state of Iowa is covered. And uh, we've actually started to trickle west of the Missouri River into Nebraska. So um, tar spot is is that uh, that bully in your cornfield, and he probably does look that like that. Uh, again, something we need to worry about, or or we need to be paying attention to for 2022. We've learned a lot about tar spot, uh, especially in, from 2021. It was a heavy year for tar spot. 2021 was. Um, we know that it overwinters in the upper Midwest and it overwinters in residue. So we just need to know that, uh, you know, if we go back into a corn on corn situation where we had heavy tar spot, if everything comes together, uh, that could be a tar spot uh, situation again. We know that some hybrids are more tolerant than others. There's no silver bullet product or hybrid out there that takes care of tar spot completely. We just know that there are some hybrids that have more tolerance than others. And we will pass that information along to you um, to make sure that you understand if you have a, a high risk area in tar spot, we can get you a product that has a higher tolerance to tar spot and to help you work through, through those scenarios as well with other management activities. Uh, the severity of tar spot is going to depend on the hybrid, uh, the weather, and what time it flares up. So you think of the disease triangle. We have to have all of those things come together in order for tar spot to be really impactful. Um, you know, 2018 was the last year things were really bad up until 2021. So, but it's important to understand that tar spot has a 14 to 21 day latent period. So it will hang out there. So we may go out with a fungicide at VT or R1 and, uh, you know, we may have things taken care of for a while, but tar spot will sit there and just basically hang out for 14 to 21 days. And that may be after um, our fungicide wears off. So we need to be prepared to, to go out there with another fungicide application in certain situations. So it's just something to be paying attention to in 2022 uh, and just be aware of it. And it's also important not to forget that fungicides reduce the severity of other diseases too. So Again, having something that's uh, labeled for tar spot, make sure your fungicide is labeled for it. Um, but chances are good that we're also affecting other diseases like gray leaf spot and northern corn leaf blight. Again, multiple modes of action, something like Delaro, Delaro complete, uh, and timing is very important. We've still uh, would make the recommendation of a VTR1 up to R3 application for tar spot uh, is probably going to get you the most benefit there. This is just an example of two separate plots. The, they were planted within about 25 miles of each other. And uh, one, the uh, plot on the left had did not have fungicide. And you can see those two hybrids down there. The exact same two hybrids um, planted in a different area, but we used Delaro. Uh, you can see the reduction in severity of tar spot there. So again, just goes to show you that uh, you know a fungicide, again, timely application, we can reduce the severity of tar spot. I want to wrap this up by talking about some of the new things that are coming down the pipeline uh, with channel seeds and bear crop science. And uh, some of these things you guys will be able to take a look at along with us in 2022. So the first one I want to talk about is short statured corn or short corn or smart corn. There's a couple of different names for it. Um, we will be having a, a opportunity to put a couple of different trials out in 2022 with uh, some select cooperators to take a look at short corn and uh, give you the chance to take a look at it too. Short corn is just that, it is short corn. So we're working on a, a, a genetic trait that actually shortens the internodes in between in the plants themselves. So 
we're looking at plants that are about seven foot tall or shorter. So that'd be significantly shorter than say a standard uh, taller hybrid. And ear height on these products uh, minimum is going to be 24 inches. So lots of potential features, advantages, and benefits with this system as it continues to develop. Obviously, we're looking at a, the feature being a reduced plant height. We're going to see a denser leaf canopy. So um, that will help us shade the rows a little faster and help with weed control. And we will see, uh, hope to see deeper roots that grow faster. We are seeing a much more robust root system with these products that goes faster, so when, or grows faster, so that when we have these stressful situations like 2021, um, hopefully these roots can get down faster and find moisture and the nutrients that they need in order to stay healthy. Some of the advantages, obviously improved standability, hopefully better stress tolerance, um, some of the potential benefits, a longer uh, access window. So if we need to get in with a fungicide or a herbicide uh, or even a harvest window, um, we can extend that in-season access. We can improve harvestability and increase yield stability as well. This is just an example of uh, some of the tests that uh, we got that Mother Nature threw at us in 2021. Uh, some high winds come through the Midwest and you can see that small square right in the middle. That is our short corn trial. Uh, everything seems to be standing pretty good for the most part, surrounded by tall corn, which did not take it as well. But we again, we saw a nice reduction in green snap root lodging and stock lodging as well. Um, so those are some of the nice benefits that we'll we'll be seeing and, and be able to show you. Over the Midwest, uh, across the Midwest this year, we hope to have close to 180 total trials trials with uh, a couple of different trial hybrids of short corn uh, in 2022. So we, we just want to get it out there and give cooperators the chance on a small scale to just take a look at it and try a, a few different uh, protocols that we have out there so we can test the flexibility of this all season access. We give guys uh, you know, fungicide versus no fungicide, uh, an opportunity to check that out, or side dressing nitrogen, or starter fertilizer, no starter fertilizer. We have different population trials that we're going to try out there, or even just to understand how the ear height is affected or responds across different soil types, different slopes, and different uh, topographies. So, you know, we're going to gather that information and share it back with you. And uh, again, just try to learn as much as we can now. And uh, before this trait comes out, so we have a better understanding about this trait. But again, something very exciting that's coming down the pipeline. The one that's actually here, the trait that's actually here that we're really excited about that uh, is available commercially is SmartStax Pro. So the next uh, development or evolution in insect trait tolerance below ground for corn rootworm is called SmartStax Pro. Now we are working on other events above ground and below ground for insect traits. So the pipeline is full, but the one that we're most excited about is the one that's here now, and that is SmartStax Pro. So SmartStax Pro is the next generation in corn rootworm protection. Uh, and again, it's something totally different. Normally, like with SmartStax and, and other competitor traits out there, we rely uh, on BT proteins to, uh, to take care of corn rootworm infestations. Well, SmartStax Pro adds a new completely novel mode of action called RNAi or RNA interference. This is the first new corn rootworm mode of action in 16 years, so it's pretty exciting for us. That's been in development for a long time. How BT modes of action differ from RNAi is, is pretty unique. Usually BT proteins, once they get inside the root or the gut of a corn rootworm, uh, they usually crystallize and then they cause gut rupture and basically the bug dies of sepsis. But with RNAi or RNA interference, what happens is down at a molecular level and it only affects the corn rootworm insect. Um, the RNAi technology will actually disrupt the creation of a life essential protein that a corn rootworm needs to survive. And without that protein, they don't survive and they die. So it's a pretty unique mode of action, brand new. And again, it happens on a molecular level. So that's pretty cool. So what can you expect? We do have some limited units out there for sale uh, that will be out in commercial fields. So we'll be able to get a great look at that. 
in commercial volume, and then a larger scale uh, production will be for next year. In our market development plots that we have scattered across the state and across the country, we'll be launching six new products in Iowa in the 98 to 112 day relative maturity range. So covering all those key uh, corn rootworm relative maturities, we've got six new hybrids that are out there that will be out there for testing uh, and eventually be for sale in 2023. So we're pretty excited about that. If you have any interest in seeing any of these products, um, again, talk to your channel seedsman, talk to your field sales rep, or even your technical agronomist, and we can certainly um, work out the details to get you a look at that, whether it's in a plot, in a technical development trial, uh, technology development trial, something like that. We can certainly um, get you access to that, but we're pretty excited about these features that are coming down the product lineup. Guys, that's it. Uh, we can close the book officially on 2021 and be done with that year. Let's look ahead to 2022. Matt and I certainly appreciate you guys following along. You know, this is session three. I encourage you, if you haven't already, go back and watch session one and session two on our YouTube channel. Um, we go through the early part of uh, the 2021 growing season and the mid part. Uh, and again, we wrap it up with this session here. So a good one, two, three punch as far as kind of. Uh, reviewing 2021 and then finally closing the book on that chapter and uh, getting ready for 2022. So again, guys, we really appreciate your time. Uh, hopefully we've provided you with some good information here. Um, Matt and I will continue this series throughout the year, but you can uh, follow the whole channel team. Uh, all of our technical agronomists are on Twitter, so you can follow us there. We have our own uh, Iowa channel YouTube page. Uh, so please follow us there as well. And uh, as soon as we get uh, some good information, we'll be sure to share that with you guys that way. 